United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, could I get a uh, motion to accept our agenda? A second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. And I believe we start with uh, a very fun uh, activity, which is recognition of Main Street Spelling Bee and Middle School Geography Bee winners. So, so How good Geography you. Bee? Is that from last year? From middle School. Middle School. Oh, middle, middle School. school. Middle school. <laughs> <laughs> Second. It's Groundhog Day. So, um, unfortunately, I want to say that Ms. Chapnick is quite ill and has the flu and is unable to join us tonight. So we've asked our fine Dr. Kaur um, to join us in recognizing the students because she was one of the moderators for the B. So, Dr. Kaur? I was. So, I don't know what I need. Yeah. Somewhere you want that one. This one. This one. Okay, so I'm not going to do this as well as, oops, I'm not going to do this as well as Ms. Chapnick because she's so awesome, but she did send me a little speech that I'm supposed to say, so here we go. The 11th Annual Main Street School Spelling Bee was on Wednesday, January 10th. We applaud all of our finalists for participating in this exciting event. The fourth grade bee went for 10 rounds. Um, oh, and I'm going to need help. Chung. No, the Shalin, but no, for the fourth grade B. Not here? Oh, okay. Well, then, I, then I'm going to try and say it as best as I can. Chung-Yun, Chung -Yun? Yeah. Chung -Yun Kawata was the winner, and, jo and Jordana Lax was our runner-up. Jordana? Jordana, come on up. And now you're going to have to walk all the way around because you're going to have to shake everybody's hand. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> the fifth grade B um, went for seven rounds. Shaylin Chang was our winner, and Wilson Lark was our runner up. Shailen? So congratulations to our winners and runners-up. We are so proud of all of our students who participated. Also, this is a little awkward. A special thank you to Dr. Kaur and <laughs> Mayor Smith uh, for moderating uh, the event and to PTSA for sponsoring it. Thank you, Dr. Kaur. Uh, so just as we had some excitement at Main Street School, we had some ex excitement over at the middle school. I'd like to invite Mr. Sotile. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, it is uh, you know, that time of year for us where we uh, have our school-wide geography be. Uh, students in November take a written test. Our entire school participates uh, to get us down to 10 finalists. And on the 12th of January, 
we held our 10th annual Geography Bee in our theater uh, with an audience of the entire middle school as, and some parents. And our 10 students did a fantastic job. It was a highly competitive bee uh, going through a number of rounds before we got down to our final two students. Uh, and those final two were our runner-up, Andrew Zhao, uh, last year's champion, by the way, and this year's champion, Graham Adams. Uh, and so... Before I, oh, I, guess, I, I was just going to say a few words about this. It's a storied rivalry, Graham and, and Andrew. They, they, they go back several years now in terms of competing. Graham having had a championship from the, from the Main, Main Street School, the uh, Andrew winning last year at the middle school, and now Graham uh, coming back this year. So quite a, uh, quite a storied rivalry, a couple of heavyweights, and m many congratulations to Graham. He'll be taking the online test uh, to qualify for the State B tomorrow, right, Graham? All right, and so we're looking forward to, to great things. The last thing I want to say is that uh, in addition to great competition and, and, and really great performance on the part of our students, they had to go to a double tiebreaker, by the way, to, to get to, to, to win this. Um, the sportsmanship and, and the camaraderie that was uh, evident both on the stage among our competitors as well as from our audience members was second to none. Students were seen high-fiving one another when they got correct answers. A uh, student missed an answer. He was consoled by one of his fellow competitors. I mean, it, was, it was a testament not only to geographical knowledge, which we all know is, is incredibly important, um, but to the way that we treat one another in our school community, and that's even more important. So congratulations to Graham. Come on up. forward to sticking around, uh, please stay, and if you're looking for a, a quick exit before we get into our longer discussions and comment period, uh, this is an opportunity for you. Uh, I'll start by just welcoming everyone again, and I just have a few opening remarks to share. Uh, I hope you've had a chance to review the agenda, our uh, board meeting FAQ, and there's also, uh, we just put out a, a helpful document written by our excellent attorney uh, that provides some legal guidance regarding uh, discussion around personnel. Uh, topics. Uh, today is kind of the Super Bowl of school board meetings. We have a lot of important ground to cover. Uh, the focus of tonight's agenda is a roundtable discussion, providing an update of our uh, annual goals for the, the district and our buildings and departments. Uh, we are a successful, high-performing school district that continues to digitally, di di diligently work at better serving student academic success, civic participation, and social-emotional well-being. And we do that by improving curriculum and instruction. We do that by supporting our staff with fair contracts and professional support. We do that by maintaining our and improving our facilities. And we do that with responsible budgeting. And all of these are aspects of tonight's discussion. But before we start this important discussion, we will open our, our go to the next part of our meeting uh, by allowing community comment. And I would like to affirm that the board and the administration value and do incorporate uh, the feedback of the community, so we, we welcome you here. Uh, and we also, in terms of we are going through a tenure process right now, and we really appreciate the letters that we have received, and I want to let you know that the board and the administration uh, do appreciate and do consider them as part of that process. Uh, the board and the administration always seek to have in place and where needed to improve systems. In fact, we have just spent 90 minutes uh, discussing the tenure process in executive session, which is uh, the period prior to uh, And so what I want to share in terms of if you've come to speak about that process and make a comment, uh, the board wishes it could be uh, transparent and frank on this matter, but we respect the right of confidentiality for our staff and students. And as our uh, attorney has said, to do otherwise uh, in terms of his guidance would violate the law and would likely expose the district to liability. 
So if anyone feels the need to communicate with the board this evening, please be mindful of these confidentiality concerns and please understand that uh, while we appreciate your comments, we won't be able to respond to them because of these uh, guidelines that we're following. So uh, we will open it to community comment. A reminder that we ask you to compose your thoughts so that your comments are less than three minutes. I hope mine have been less than three. And uh, we would like to give everyone a chance to speak. Uh, these comments are important and they are also followed by an important discussion. So I'll aim to find that balance and, and ask that we keep it moving. Uh, and because this is midterms week, the exams, I would like to ask that if, it, if there are any students who are here, uh, that they take the opportunity to speak first. So you would, uh, if you'd like to share a comment, please uh, come to the microphone. Uh, this allows people to hear you on video if they watch later. And please introduce yourself by name. Uh, hello, I'm Ian McClure. Oh, that's a little close. Um, so I'm here with regards to the tenure of Madame Barbagallo. I've had Madame Barbagallo for three years now, since my freshman year. And I'm basically just here to say that it's my opinion that she is an excellent French teacher, and I think that um, her employment in the district is a great service to our language department, and I think she's a very uh, important member of our school community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Luke Williams. So obviously you've probably been able to tell at this point that there are a lot more kids in here than I would normally expect at least. <laughs> and the reason for that is exactly as Ian stated, uh, Madame Barbagala's tenure. So I feel like one thing that a lot of uh, adults don't realize that a lot of the kids do is that teachers usually only have one of two qualities. It's either they're a really good teacher but you don't like them as a person, or they're a really good person, but you don't like them as a teacher. It's very rare that there's a teacher that has both of those qualities, and I think we can agree, considering the number of students who have come here today, that Barbara Gala does have both these qualities, and I hope you take that into consideration. Thank you. Well, as I said, we have, uh Appreciate receiving your letters and read them closely. Is there anyone else who'd like to make a comment about anything related to our agenda? Please go to the microphone. Thank you, students. That was great. Um, so my name is Sally Frank, and I have four kids. Two graduated last year, and um, two are still in school. And um, three of them have taken French. One has not yet had Madame Barbagala. And um, we, we love Madame Barbara Gala. We think she is an incredible teacher. And I speak French, and I see the fruits of her work at my house, not only with the progress that my own children make, but I see so many of the kids, particularly the juniors who are in class with Julian, um, at my house doing projects from cooking and speaking in French the entire time to taking videos of other outdoor activities or projects that um, that show me that they're speaking and they speak with me in French and so I see the progress as being incredible and I I wrote a long letter so I don't I'm not going to repeat that but my daughter Zoe um, was actually on the committee um, that helped look into world language as a student and she actually sat in on the classes when um, we tested different teachers. And so she had an opportunity to glimpse other candidates as well and to judge Madame Barbagallo against other candidates against teachers she had had. And she was one of the students who chose Madame Barbagallo and she loved having Madame Barbagallo. And I just want to read a few of the things that she said in her letter. She wrote a very long letter, but I'm reading some excerpts. Um, this is, these are Zoe's words. As the first French teacher I've ever had who actually enforced the French only rule in class and who made sure that each student got speaking time every day, I, that was a, I want to support her, her tenure as part of the sentence I took out. <laughs> um, she said, without a doubt, she brought my interest back to French, which I had lost after coming to high school and seeing all the new opportunities available to me. I felt that French would not be so relevant to my future and would therefore not be worth to continue prioritizing. By the next summer, I was already in an immersion trip in French, and now I'm taking um, higher level classes at Brown, and I wouldn't have been able to get into those classes had I not had the education that Madame Barbagallo gave me. 
She said, above all, Madame Barbagallo cares about her students. My junior year, seeing how much I'd improved from my summer in France, she used her lunch break to go over extra readings and grammar lessons with me. And on the other side of the spectrum, she went to great lengths to organize peer tutoring sessions for her students who were falling behind. The only complaints I ever heard about Madame Barbagallo are essentially that she doesn't tolerate laziness. Um, Zoe went on to say, I'm no longer a student at IHS. I have nothing to gain from Madame Barbagallo staying or going. That I'm writing this as a mark of how much value my experience at Irvington High School, how much I value my experience at Irvington High School, and what an impact Madame Barbagallo had in shaping it. Two years ago, I was grateful to be a part of the process choosing IUFSD's new mission. It is to create a challenging and supportive learning environment in which each student attains his or her highest potential for academic achievement, critical thinking, and lifelong learning, and to encourage the discovery and development of students' individual strengths, skills, and talents, and foster social and civic responsibility. I cannot think of a teacher who better embodies that than Madame Barbagallo. There are a few more who wanted to speak, so you're welcome to, to use the microphone. My name is Brian Smith, and I have a sophomore in high school, and I have a seventh grader. And it's the first time I've ever spoken uh, in a non-official capacity. So, well, but, welcome to the meeting. Well, thank you. Um, and I've obviously never spoken about uh, tenure before, but I saw the positive impact um, Mrs. Barbara Gallo had on my daughter, and I felt compelled to say something. Um, one of my major regrets in life is a lack of fluency in any language other than English. A major wish for my children is that they never suffer the same deficiency, which is why I'm so thrilled that my daughter loves studying French with Mrs. Barbara Gallo. Not only does she love it, but her proficiency is already very high, as she demonstrated on a family trip last, last year. My daughter was lucky enough to have Ms. Tesler in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, and she instilled not only a love of the French language, but also French culture. After an uneven freshman year, last year, this year, my daughter's sophomore year with Mrs. Barbara Gallo, she found the same excitement and love of learning of a language again. I attribute a lot of that to Mrs. Barbara Gallo. Her love of language, as well as the immersive nature of her classroom experience, which is conducted solely in French, really inspire my daughter. My daughter has been so inspired by Mrs. Barbara Gallo that she has signed up for a, a month-long language program this summer in France. Before she le leaves for France, my daughter asked my wife if she could set up some time with Mrs. Barbara Gallo to ensure she is fully prepared for her trip. With excellent teachers like Mrs. Barbara Gallo, I'm confident Irvington can help both my children on the path to fluency. I believe it is crucially important to keep a native speaker like Mrs. Barbara Gallo, who so loves to teach and clearly has the gift of motivating students, which is further uh, evidenced by the attendance here today of so many students. Thus, I strongly urge you to grant her tenure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Hey everyone, and excuse my voice, I have laryngitis, but nothing stops me. Um, <laughs> it's not my cause. So I'm Erin Bernstein, I'm the parent of a second grader at Dow's Lane, and it's really apropos, I feel like, that I'm here today uh, to talk about the mission of putting foreign language into the elementary school and to piggyback what Brian said about having fluency, you know, children having fluency. It starts in, with their learning in elementary school, and it's so important. And I also wanted to thank uh, Ms. Marinello and the YMCA for their after-school programs. I understand the Spanish classes are moving forward, even the K and one class, which was put in a little bit late, which I'm grateful for. And my son is eager to start learning Spanish um, in a couple of weeks. And if he's not, well, he will be. <laughs> Thank you very much. No I, I really appreciate everyone who came in. Oh, is there oh wait, someone else? No, we're not done. Didn't see the hand in the corner. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Ina Kapilovich. I have a daughter in kindergarten and one in first, uh, one, a one-year-old at home. Uh, she will be a future Dow's Lane student. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I wanted to piggyback on what Erin was saying. Uh, my daughter is um, fluent in both Russian and English, and it's been a blessing to see all that, is, that has inspired in her beyond her fluency, beyond her interest in different cultures. Um, she's just always asking questions about not just being Russian, but about being 
French or being German and about different words and what they mean in different languages and how you say this and how you say that in a different language. And it's just been, it's been a blessing for us to be able to give that to her at home, but we are also really excited about giving it to her in uh, school through the Spanish club, but also maybe through this French program that these students here are representing. So thank you for considering this wonderful program and we're excited to be a part of it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I wanted to um, echo on the comments that of Erin, uh, thanking the principals uh, of elementary for, and Dr. Core as well for following up and, and bringing uh, some classes, uh, Spanish classes for the little guys. Um, our family is going to leave town for temporarily, so unfortunately we're not going to take advantage of that, but we look forward to coming back and taking advantage of that, those initiatives. Thank you so much. We also heard, um, I also personally heard that um, the French teacher uh, who's up for tenure is also a fantastic teacher, and uh, um, I'm very happy that uh, she's been considered for tenure and, and support that, uh, her work as well. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Ann Florence Carroll. I have two daughters, Suzanne, who is a freshman at the University of New Hampshire, and Kelly Carroll, who is in um, Madame Barbara Gallo's Honors French Three class this year. We've had a wonderful experience with her. Um, Kelly is a, an amazing student, never a problem, never an issue, loves Madame Barbara Gallo. Um, She's so enthusiastic about her, about the way she teaches, about the vibe she has in the class, the discipline, the formality. Um, she thinks it's amazing. The kids aren't distracted. They're focused. They're interested. Madame Barbara Gallo is interesting. She's interesting in her Frenchness, you know. Um, and uh, Suzanne, you know, really struggled with French. And then Barbara Gallo just like held on to her and wouldn't let her fall or fail. And not only did she not fail, she didn't withdraw from the class like she wanted to do. She didn't give up. She enlisted a peer tutor. She worked with her, and she ended up doing great. You know, well, you know, she ended up doing great, and she got a great grade on her French Regents exam. And she's taking French at uh, college now. So, I mean, that's a, a success story. So, we enthusiastically support tenure for Madame Barbara Gallo. Thank you. Doing the long scan now. I don't want to cut anyone off. <laughs> All right, going once, twice. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, we really appreciate your comments, and particularly uh, thank you, students, uh, for, for coming and, and speaking and attending. Uh, I'm always, and I think we're always impressed uh, by uh, the public speaking of, of our high school students, and uh, great job here. Uh, you're welcome to stay, because we're going to talk all about uh, high school and, and other programs that, uh, in, in our other schools, but uh, if you're needing to study for your exams, uh, you're welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and now we will transition. Uh, if anybody needs to leave, I'll, I'll take a little 30 second pause here, but then we'll transition into our CIS. <laughs> 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 okay. All right, well, I think I introduced what we're going to talk about, and I'll hand it off to uh, Dr. Harrison and Dr. Cord to, to get the discussion going. Yeah, so I, I think I'll actually um, go backwards a little bit and uh, reference uh, Ms. Frank's comments uh, this evening where she read the district mission statement. And when we think about what our goals and are across the district, everything really um, begins to come from the, the district's uh, mission statement. And in doing so, we've had lots of conversation in this room over the past two years about what our work is uh, strategically and rolling out and developing a strategic plan that's outlined through a series of six um, strategic objectives. And in doing so, we're taking steps forward in the linkage and alignment of all of our work across the district. 
And this year, our goals took on a bit of a different process, a bit of a different form, and it's um, a process that we've acknowledged and committed to continuing to, to grow moving forward. And in doing so, not only do these goals that were developed across the district, in schools and in individual departments align with our mission, are linked directly to our strategic ob objectives, but there's a tremendous amount of alignment that occurs K through 12 in the focus work um, that we're doing. Um, so we have um, a program tonight where we're going to dig into some of this work, um, not in tremendous detail, uh, but with some selected highlights and some engagement. Um, before I introduce the, the, what our, really our district goals are, um, and then we will, I think it's important for the record to introduce all of our colleagues sitting around the table. Um, the design tonight is for um, kind of an authentic conversation where our administrators and we have our principals and assistant principals sitting around the table um, are going to provide some updates on their goals um, and in the process are going to talk about some of their needs moving forward, some of which may surface in our budget discussions that will occur in the next um, two months. And then we're also going to chat about facilities a little bit because we know there's needs um, in each of our schools related to not only the maintenance of buildings but opportunities to support programs that are related again back to our mission and our strategic objectives. Um, so um, that said before I frame the goals I thought it would be va some value in going around the table and just for record um, everybody introducing themselves so folks watching at home will be able to see who the faces are because you don't have name tags. So. Hi. I'm Dave Cohen, I'm the principal of the high school. Everyone. I'm Michael Hanna. I'm president of the school board. Maria Cashkin, vice president of the school board. I'm David Sotow, principal of Irvington Middle School. I'm David Graber, school board trustee. I'm Matt Samuelson. I'm the assistant principal of high school. Brian Friedman, school board trustee. Andrew Cantor, assistant principal at Dow's Lane. Deb Hargrave, school board member. Carol Strong, assistant superintendent of business. Allison Daly, assistant principal at the middle school. Catherine Palmieri, board member. Jenny Arnold, principal of Training Corps, Assistant Superintendent for Instruction and Human Resources. Mara Geddes, School Board Trustee. And then Chris Harrison, your superintendent. So, so with that said, um, we had three categories of goals uh, that we were d diving into uh, across the district this year. And um, one related to communications, um, which was to look at um, increasing um, our communications um, launching a new website, which will happen later this spring, and introducing our district identity, which has been rolling out throughout the course of the school year. We also have a couple operations and finance goals um, that um, looking at evaluating our buildings and grounds um, uh, needs to develop some long-range plans, which we've had conversation about, not only in this room, but with the Buildings and Grounds Committee and starting to looking at developing projections for long range um, financing in, in the school district. Um, but then we had, not that those aren't important, um, but very important and necessary category of goals related to curriculum and instruction that I'll ask um, Dr. Kaur uh, to speak to. You know, our goals this year are, um one of the things that we focus on is a continuation of goals. So over the course of the three years, we hope, thank you. We hope that you've started to hear some consistency, that we don't you know, change goals. We don't say, oh, this year we'll do this and next year we'll do that. And our goals um, were actually um, excited this year. We were able to link our goals to the strategic plan. So I think for the first time, we have a year where we have what we would say as administrators is a pretty comprehensive approach where there's a strategic plan, our, our goals and our, and our mission and our theory of action are linked to that. And the work of uh, the district and the work of our buildings is linked to that. Um, we have had around a goal around teaching thinking and embedding thinking as part of our curriculum and we do that through our instructional design. So many of you have heard us talk about stage one of the instructional planner. Um, we are in our fourth year of um, embedding unit planning as part and parcel of the Irvington School District. Um, went from having no curriculum to having a written curriculum. <coughs> And this year, we also launched our focus on assessment, which is stage two of instructional design. So in this, first, in this first year of assessment, it doesn't mean that we haven't been assessing for all these years. We've been doing a lot of assessing. We're trying to build a more comprehensive, cohesive approach to assessment. 
So um, I'm going to be careful here because I could steal the thunder of my colleagues because I have so many fabulous examples. So I will not give any examples. But I will say um, we are proud of the work we've started to do in benchmarking and having a consistent way to look at our students as cohorts. We are also um, embedding and defining very clear goals. We've done that certainly through our world language department as well as many other departments. We have um, a commitment to professional learning based on our goals and expectations for what we expect our teachers to be able to know and be able to do in light of what we want our students to know and be able to do. You'll also hear from um, our administrative colleagues about the work around technology. We've, been, we've done a lot of work in all of our buildings, um, and while there's always more to be done, um, I would guess that everyone um, has examples of how we have started to shift um, the technology in our district. So our goals are very um, connected, and there's not one goal that we're working on specifically. It's a series of goals all linked back to practice in our classroom, all linked back to the level of instruction that we expect to see in our classroom from our, from our teacher colleagues, as well as then what we want students to know, look like, and be able to do. So that said, we often think that we plan for whoever goes first and, and we worry <laughs> about who is going to talk uh, too much. So I think rather than, <laughs> rather than we always start at one end or the other. So I, I look to our colleagues at the middle school to mix it up a little Ooh. bit. Ooh. <laughs> Very nice. Al and Dave. Raucous crowd tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't take a lot. It's excited. Thanks, Dr. Harrison. Um, <laughs> Thanks for uh, thanks for not sharing that before. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I said this was going to be an authentic conversation. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It is uh, it is a pleasure to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing around goals uh, around our two primary goals at the middle school, uh, and to and to talk and, and listen really to our colleagues share their some of the same work at, at, at the other buildings. Um, you know, as Raina talked about, there are our, our two primary goals in the area of instruction have to do with implementing instructional practices that, that elevate student thinking and then thinking about how do we know and how does, how does assessment get used to, um, to help us continually improve that process. Uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on the first of those two goals and, and, and Al will talk a little bit about the second. I'm Staley, sorry. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to talk about at the middle school, um, as there is at all of our buildings, with respect to the instructional practices on which we've focused. Um, it all begins with the idea of professional learning. I'm, I'm glad that Raina went there in, in her comments. Um, we have been focused quite a bit in all of our content areas on really targeted, really meaningful professional learning that can be used to turn into uh, continually improving and, 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 and more focused and more responsive instructional practices. Um, I could go into a lot of directions with that, but in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on something that relates to kind of a new addition for the middle school this year with respect to program, um, and then try to tie it to some of the other things uh, that, that are happening that we're, that we're, of which we're equally proud. Um, this year, thanks to um, last year's approved budget, we were able to add the staff necessary to expand our technology program and our elective program for our eighth grade students. Um, and what that's resulted in is the introduction of a new course, uh, the first session of which has just come to an end, uh, called Green Architecture. And Green Architecture is a course uh, under the Project Lead the Way uh, umbrella. It's uh, what Project Lead the Way calls a specialization unit, which means that it's beyond their two foundation units that make up our seventh and eighth grade technology program. Students in the eighth grade had a chance to join that class this year. Um, we were running two sections of the class, and you know what I had the chance to see just the other day as students presented their final product um, was students putting out there a, uh, a design that they had put together using some of the same principles that they had learned through our technology program, incorporating the idea of, of sustainability, incorporating the idea of, of, of green building techniques, um, identifying what it is in, in what they value that uh, can translate into design, um, and then sharing where along the way they had struggles, where they could have done better, where they could have become more green perhaps. Um, and, and, and it was really a, a very nice display. There was a great deal of enthusiasm among the students in the class. Um, there was, again, the camaraderie I talked about with respect to the geography bee was evident as they kind of shared feedback toward one another. And 
uh, talked about designs that they found to be particularly innovative or, or um, things that they would have liked to incorporate into their own from one of their, their fellow students' presentations. Um, it, it was a nice energy in the room and, and really a nice kickoff uh, for this program for us. This wouldn't be possible without the professional learning that, that goes into a program like PLTW. Um, the teacher that, that is teaching the course had to go um, away uh, over the summer to be trained in the course. Um, and that's in addition to prior training that, 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 that he's had, um, he and his colleagues have had around the PLTW program as we've built it really from the ground up at the middle school um, through a lot of support from, from Dr. Kaur, from, from outside agencies, through grants, and from the Board of Ed. Um, it's one of those things that we're looking to continue and so we're looking to build on this success. The nice thing about where we stand right now is last year's um, addition gives us room to grow. It was part of a multi-year strategy to really expand the, the choice, um, the opportunity for eighth graders to, to kind of take some control over their destiny and the parts of their schedule that really can be flexible um, and, and really go from where we are right now, which is this one great elective that we've added. To, to adding more, and we, we talked a little bit about that with our soon-to-be eighth grade parents uh, at last week's orientation program. Um, I would just want to connect the learning in green architecture, which is one class in one particular part of our program for one of our grade levels, to the ongoing work that's happening in, in, in some of our other uh, grades with respect to elevating our instructional practices. Um, the other example I might give you right now, and, and, and again, there's a lot of ways to go, but I'm going to focus on science because science is some of um, some of the new frontier for us a little bit. Uh, new York State has released a new set of science standards. Uh, one time they were called the, the next generation uh, standards. The New York State has adopted them and, and, and put their own name to them. But in any event, um, what's happening is a look at science instruction that is more inquiry based. Um, and I think that's an operative word for us in a lot of our, our areas of study um, where students are um, Entering science, entering their study of science with not a, a, a procedural, okay, do this, then do this, then do this kind of an approach to, say, a, a lab test, but rather considering a phenomena, as it's called, that's the terminology that's, that's, that's formally used by the standards, um, and trying to come to, uh, th through investigation, through some learning, through some collaboration, to, to a deeper understanding of what it is that causes that phenomena to occur. Um, it's, it's the scientific method in, in, in some ways as we, as we once knew, um, but it's not so formulaic or rote as, as perhaps we once learned it. Um, and, and it's something that's very exciting. Uh, earlier this year, um, in, in working through a particular unit of study, just through the observation process, I had the chance to observe three different teachers in the course of about a week and a half, all in science classes. So I really got you know, multiple opportunities to be in and see the development of this, of this unit of study. And, and what was so astounding was what students did um, when they weren't given all of this content instruction right up front, but instead they were given a problem to consider, given a, an object to consider, and, and, and trying to come up with some theories about how it worked the way that it did, use some background knowledge that they had, and then augment that with, with, the, with the exploration and the investigation that they needed to, to do in order to, to move forward. This is supported by professional learning as well that our teachers are, are currently engaged in. Um, it's something that we'll be moving forward with as we go from grade six to seven to eight and, 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 and think uh, about how we want our, our science program to grow. Um, it's indicative of, of all, that goal, all of that first goal is, which is looking at how the units of study that we've written can actually be brought to life in terms of the goals that we have, not just around content knowledge or even skills, but also around thinking. Uh, and so it's, it's work that's in progress. It's work that we're seeing good evidence of, of, of movement toward and, and work that we're excited to see continue. So, it's a nice segue. <laughs> so connected to what David just shared, our second goal, which is a goal in, shared by all of our four buildings, is to develop a balanced assessment system that measures content knowledge skill, but also the dispositional thinking that David was just speaking about. So tonight, in preparing um, for this evening's roundtable, we thought in terms of the assessment goal and the work that's been happening at the middle level during the first half of the years, we really wanted to talk about our um, goal of building a system to target and assess the academic and behavioral needs of our students, which is related to response to intervention. So I know in past presentations you've heard from our K-5 to colleagues 
their development of an RTI response to intervention plan. So I'm happy to share that this year, the middle level, along with our high school colleagues, we are building our approach and our plan that aligns with the secondary model. So specifically, um, we wanted to share a couple different um, pieces of the work that's happened this year. The first is that professional learning. So we had in the fall three different grade level training workshops um, to engage all of our teachers, general, te general education teachers, special education teachers, support staff, in building the common knowledge and common understanding of this multi-tiered approach that's called response to intervention. This spring, um, we're gonna be having a fourth training workshop, which will be for our phys ed and our unified arts teachers. So as of right now, people have a common understanding and we're really at the next step to push further and deeper into the work. In addition to the professional learning opportunities, we also have introduced the Ames Web Screener, which I know, again, you've heard about from Dow's and Main Street. This year, our goal was to introduce and implement that tool with our sixth grade classes. How we began this work was one, we shared it with all of our colleagues at the training sessions, the tool, um, even with our seventh and eighth grade colleagues, because they're gonna be hearing about it and seeing the data. Um, we first um, had a meeting with all of our sixth grade staff, with Raina and Ms. Chapnick, and what we decided to do was instead of just getting into the logistics of Ames Web, was we shared with our colleagues all of the data from our now sixth graders. So we had, for example, the fifth grade data from the fall, winter, and spring Ames Web, and that was extremely powerful to look at the students we now had, and this was in October when we had this meeting with our sixth grade team, to look at the students and how they performed across the year last year. Um, and did we think that that data represented how they were performing thus far in sixth grade? Did we feel like they were in and receiving the necessary supports? Once um, we had that preliminary meeting, we also had a training session um, with our sixth grade ELA and math and special education teachers, because as you know, Ames Web is a screener for reading and mathematics. And I'm happy to share that just this week, we, our students, are um, in the midst of taking the Ames Web assessment for the first time. Typically, it's a screener that is used three times a year, but we need to have the training piece and the professional learning piece in place in the fall with the goal of having two cycles of Ames Web this year. Um, and we got through some of the logistic kinks today. Um, and we're really looking forward to now having this wealth of data. And as you know, the turnaround time is really impressive. Um, and so in order to have a system for looking and analyzing that data, we have created this year a data team, which exists in our other buildings as well, a key component of a successful and effective RTI plan. Our data team is comprised of special education teachers, general education teachers, specifically those who provide academic intervention services in the area of reading and writing. We feel they'll bring an important lens to the conversation, the school psychologists, counselors, and speech language therapists, and myself. We have had a training session already to sort of beef up our knowledge about, you know, how can data inform our practice on an individual child, but also like about a cohort in terms of programming and scheduling recommendations. I'm happy to say in a week, I'm taking a subcommittee of our data team, and we're gonna spend time at Main Street observing their data team in action, again, as part of our learning and professional learning process. And we will be meeting with our data team early in February to look at our first round of Ames Web data that the students are you know, taking this week. Um, again, with the goal of making plans for targeting the needs of individual students this year, but then also having the data from the spring Ames Web to inform our recommendations for next year for individual teachers and, and support classes um, and beyond. So we're very much starting the, the journey of developing our own RTI plan at the middle level, but I think that we're quite proud of you know, what we've learned so far and how much this additional you know, data measure that is Ames Web can add and enrich our existing data set as we make decisions about children and, and programming. I just want to jump in for a second. I thought that was a great, efficient update uh, in terms of the work you're doing, and uh, and I appreciate it even spelling out very quickly what some of the you know the Ames Web, et cetera. Is. Right. That's fantastic for folks who are just jumping in. <laughs> but I want to add that Dr. Core also did a whole presentation about Ames Web uh, and and other assessments in November. So anyone wants to expand their knowledge can uh, can jump into sure. that conversation. Yeah, just for public record, Mr. Hanna is the
the encyclopedia of foreign <laughs> Do you want to, yeah, should we, I, I, do we want to follow up on middle school while we're there? I mean, just wonder. But, uh, yeah. yeah, why don't we do that? Yeah. Chris. Do you want to, we do? I do. Um, so I'm looking at the goals and, and the evidence and the things that we talked about back in September. Um, and I was just curious, since you started talking about it, it piqued my interest in, in thinking about the evidence around um, student work that demonstrates higher level thinking in terms of goal one. Um, and then um, the concept of, uh, and they're kind of intertwined despite the difference in the goals, is um, the developed protocol for looking at student work. And uh, I guess the question, it's not really a question, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit and just sort of get into the weeds a little bit about like what that actually is looking like in terms of A, from the teacher lens, the administrative lens, and then how that work and that protocol is being worked through with parents in terms of communication back to the house, right? So like, you know, with all the data work that you're beginning to do and beginning to layer in, um, how, how, and if not now, then how will it wind up being communicated to parents in a way that they understand? Um, you know, and then this is how we look at the work together as a department in terms of the protocol, and in terms of, uh, again, of the, um, you know, how we're highlighting the student <coughs> work at a higher level, the thinking at a higher level. So I know <coughs> that when I, when I think about like the Ames Web, for example, like part of our learning process and our work with colleagues who've already been through this is to develop like a protocol so that when we sit down and look at Ames Web, but also the other data measures, because I just you know, want to also say like we have a data set, Ames Web is one key you know, piece, but there's obviously other data points we want to look at when we're making decisions about um, a student's needs. Um, and so that, that's definitely like what we see as part of our work moving forward is what is that protocol and then as you said, how do we share that not just with staff but with the, with the greater community. Can I just add something to that? Just, you know, it's interesting, at some point you're going to get to Deb and Andrea and I think, and if Joyce were here, I think some of what you're asking also when Al, you know, says that, you know, the next step is to go down to Main Street is that evolution um, of how, and, and I won't steal anything, but you know, just how powerful, once you have that data set, the work you can do with it and engage teachers with it. So it feels like that's an evolution. So let me give you an example. I'm thinking like, so my son Stuart just came home the other day um, and he said, wow, he's got like nine new kids in the math class, right? And so like, just like walk us through like how like looking at the student work and the data from math, whatever assessment, doesn't matter, aims whatever or not, <coughs> how does that inform that that shift, and how does that get communicated to parents in terms of this is why the child is being moved into this class? Mm -hmm. So I can talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, and, and you bring up math, and math is, is, is one of those unique places for us. Uh, we have a process at the middle school where we evaluate students, or students are evaluated, I should say, on their way in, and we have a, a data set that, that's collected while students are at the Main Street School um, to, to make determinations around um, around placement and, and, and whether a student would be in math six or, or, or six accelerated. Um, what we've also maintained for some time is a process where we can again evaluate student work once they've actually spent some time at the middle school um, with our math six and our six accelerated programs running essentially parallel for the first uh, part of the year so that we can identify students that, that uh, whose work demonstrates a consistency with, with students who are going to be successful at the, or had the chance to be successful at the accelerated level and offer students the opportunity to get into that class at that point before the, the content um, between the two courses and the pace really, really diverges. Um, and so those are, those are common assessments that are given across um, the, the, uh, the two math teachers' classes um, that are, that are in, in both the first and second marking periods of the year. Uh, we look at those scores on those assessments as one point of data. Um, obviously, teachers are also assessing students' work inside class on a day-to-day -day basis for some of the, the learning behaviors that we value for, uh, for students uh, and, and that we want to see students actually walk into an accelerated class with as opposed to have to acquire as part of an accelerated class. Um, and then we make a determination as a, as a collaborative group, the math teachers, the counselors, uh, myself, um, to, to identify uh, the students that we are, we would recommend for at least having the opportunity to make the, the shift. Um, you know, that's a process we've gone through now for, for, for some time, as I said. Um, 
the number of students that, that are impacted by it in any one year can vary, and it really is, is solely dependent upon student performance. We build a schedule that, that is meant to try to accommodate the p potential for shifts. Um, it's a little bit complicated depending upon the number of students that, that uh, ultimately fall into that category. Um, but that's, that's kind of what you're referring to there. But that's a good example of actually having a couple of different points of data. Now, you know, AmesWeb is actually a good example of, it, of, of a data point that we don't have from this year to help us inform that, that that would become part of that process for the future. assessing kids writing and, 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 and in the same token really raising the level of that forbidden word of rigor in, in, the, in the writing world. Except that we had a whole discussion about rigor so we, we embraced it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I can give an example of our writing workshop which is a writing support class that we offer at the three grade levels. So we had two days um, with our teachers this summer where we looked at developing common on-demand writing assessments and then a common tool for assessing that student writing. And as we move forward too with the response to intervention approach, we envision developing those type of common assessments like, you know, with our teachers um, across disciplines. That's going to be part of, you know, assessments in addition to like an Ames web, you know, type of screener. But that's specifically just for students who need the extra support. The writing workshop example I gave, yes, those are students in like a writing workshop class. But in a regular like ELA classroom, they have their process pieces and they're using rubrics that are common on a grade level to assess student writing. Is the same criteria. Right. So we've talked about though that shit. Part of after as part of an extension of, of RTI, but not the RTI component of it, but the benchmarking component of it. That um, moving forward, we'll be developing grade level assessments, so like a writing prompt, so that there's a benchmark for what does writing look like in September, what does writing look like middle of the year, and what does writing look like in June. But that is a work in progress. And then that's work in progress, meaning that's the you're building as you continue to build the curriculum. Rich. As we continue to build our you process. You say writing workshop. You're not talking about teachers' college and sort of like. Correct. Right it's confusing. That. That's like the name of our support class. But it is that approach to teaching writing is the writing workshop yeah, of the support the, classes. The writing writing workshop. Workshop. But the kids are getting writing workshop in their ELA class as well. And to clarify, uh, Lena, what you just explained was the process for all of the grades. Exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. And teachers would be creating those. And I guess that's my question is that when I look at the strategic objective um, and I look at key actions, I'm looking at the strategic plan, it, it says that, you know, we're going to develop a process to evaluate new and existing programs. When we, this presentation is made, how do you select what supporting evidence and which process you're bringing to the table? Because I noticed, for example, that in the fall, we, you're, you selected new course selection process for the eighth grade and we spoke about um, this PLTW Green Architecture class, and we talked about the fact that we were going to have um, uh, the, the, um, the review piece as well, the balanced assessment piece. But I'm just curious, when you, when you make the presentation, why that particular process? Not, why not writing, or, or how, do you, how, what's, how, do, how do you go about selecting what supporting evidence you're presenting tonight? Well, I think, you know, the selection of, of, of the Green Architecture is based on the fact that it is a brand new offering for us. Um, it, it's, it's in its first year. We're in our you know, uh, we're at the end point of, of the first time that it's been offered. So it, it feels like a good opportunity to check in on that, to give an update. Um, and, and that's kind of, uh, I think, what was most influential in, in making that selection. Um, I, I think also when you think about the context of, of tonight's meeting, um, it, it's a little bit forward looking too and saying, where do we go from here? So um, that's where we are now and, and, and it's influencing some of what we're thinking about where we want to go next uh, with respect to our eighth grade and into the program that we offer our eighth graders. So I just want to share that I have a bet with Dr. Harrison and that the longer we go, I make some good money here. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so in thinking of the shift to the high school and um, you know when we think about um, instruction at the high school and, and, and learning, 
you know, we always talk about what we want students to be able to know and be able to do. And, you know, I think it's very easy at the high school to get really embedded in our content. I think I often start our conversations this way. So it's sort of what we want students to know in many ways is the easy part. It's what we want students to be able to do that I think has been the areas that we've been really really strong in the last few years and this year. And, you know, sort of thinking what you just talked about, Deb, you know, in, in, in preparing for tonight, it became an obvious place to sort of think about how each of our core subjects have, have been able to be embedded in um, such comprehensive work. Um, and in each case now is working with, um, you know, professionals, um, professional experts from outside that come in and work with us um, around just those questions. You know, what do we want them to, students to be able to do? So I think of English and, and the work with, with Bard and, and our writing for thinking. I think of our math program and the work that we've been doing with metamorphosis and um, social studies has been working with um, experts around making sure that we're aligned to um, the new standards, um, but really in developing our students' social studies skills. Um, we've talked about world language and our focus on speaking and listening. And this year we started with our science teachers around getting ready for the next gen standards. And, you know, come up with their own acronyms of what they call retooling lessons so that they're very student focused. Um, and one of the things that we've seen evolve at the high school is um, a lot of our meetings now have been dedicated to teachers bringing evidence of student work and sort of looking at that through the lens of whether or not um, they're, they're beginning to feel like they're accomplishing their goals um, in how they're redesigning lessons and really focusing on what, what, stu what students are doing not so much uh, what we want them to know. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, we've seen in the first half of the year different types of structured meetings that are um, having really deep impacts in certain areas. So, you know, some of those departments are further along the line. So I think the work, let's say, with math, with metamorphosis, and they've gotten very much into this understanding of uh, planning lessons and then implementing them along with the approach of metamorphosis. And then in each of those classes, they bring out evidence of student work and they further analyze that as they retweak and figure out whether their planning really led to the outcomes that they wanted. Um, last year, when we were really focusing on implementation, we looked deeply at essential questions and closing activities as, as places to target. And you know, in the closing activities, we felt uh, Matt and I felt that they were really important because it, it spoke to lesson structure, but it also created key opportunities for summary and for students to be able to demonstrate their thinking and understanding. Um, we had seen patterns at the high school where um, our lessons became sort of running day to day and um, like a, a stream of content. So it wasn't always easy to figure out where the beginning, the medium, and the end of specific lessons were. So by focusing on closing activities, we started to see, see some real movement last year in how teachers were thinking about their lessons. And I think heading into this year, um, we've seen it take on um, even next steps. And um, you know, in some ways, I go back to the essential question. We've been really targeted as a district and certainly at the high school around being able to name the four learning goals. And that's knowledge, skill, meaning, and transfer. And I bring that up because it's become such an um, important part of how teachers are now understanding how to make distinctions around um, the usage of closing activities. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if a teacher is focusing a lesson that's heavy on knowledge, there's going to be a lot of information that they need students to get. They may come up with a closing activity that's more multiple choice questions, where mm -hmm. it's just, do they get that, that knowledge? If they're focused more on skills um, for that lesson, they may come up with questions where it's more of the practice, where students are demonstrating that they can use that and, and show that skill. And finally, when we really see lessons where teachers are focusing in on meaning and on transfer, we're gonna see much more open-ended, self-reflection type questions, and often the essential question itself being used as the closing activities and exit tickets. And as Matt and I have been able to work with our teachers um, each individually through the observation cycles this year, we're seeing just that. We're seeing a lot more, not only um, usage of closing activities, but directed usage of closing activities. So it's these, these direct tie-ins. Um, and um, it's, it's, I think it's been really powerful. I think teachers are able to name these things um, in much greater detail. 
and then when they, in fact, go back to where I started, bringing evidence of student work, um, they're naming it in different ways. It's not just look at this great activity, they're actually putting it up against, am I meeting each of the four or one of the four learning goals? Um, you know, another thing that we had targeted this year around uh, the implementation of instructional practices uh, was the use of Chromebooks and um, usage of uh, Google Classroom. So last year it was an optional pilot at the high school to use um, Google Classroom with the goal and the knowledge for teachers that this year it was going to be Google Classroom for all. And we kind of went in a little bit with our fingers crossed, um, but it's been really powerful to see how much our teachers um, have become dependent upon it and really crave the usage of Classroom where um, we're not only seeing it as a way for um, students to find out assignments and get the communication around um, uh, homework and, and projects, um, but it's being used from an instructional standpoint. The amount of work that's being submitted through Google Classroom and uh, the conversations and the dialogue that's happening um, has really taken off in ways that um, we hadn't uh, previously expected up to this point in time. Um, and when you tie that in with the number of Chromebooks and the investment that we've made as a district, but specifically at the high school, um, to have them available um, in every department, um, the teachers are begging for them now. They are um, fighting with each other about being able to pile them up in classrooms. Um, and each day we're seeing more and more usage of it. So it's really powerful and it's really exciting to see. Certainly I put that out there as a reminder that you know getting more Chromebooks um, is important and you know I highlighted that you know we've seen great work through our focus um, in our five core academic subjects um, but one of the things I think that we all value in the district is knowing that we want to round out the, the full experience for students so I know as we're looking ahead to next year um, you know a little bit greater focus um, in the high school around the arts and um, the ability to support instruction is something that um, we've been thinking about. So like when I think about potential budget items, um, I know this year uh, we're running, uh, for the first time since I've been here, a second um, section of our AP art class, and we already see numbers uh, that are gonna need that next year. So um, it actually calls for the need to, for us to really be looking at about adding um, uh, an extra um, FTE to support that. And when I think of art and, and music, um, I think of two of our instructional leaders that have been supported through half of an FTE compared to the other instructional leaders. Um, but really their workload around that is just as strong. In fact, I could even argue that it's sometimes more challenging because they're going between um, multiple buildings and in their cases they're K to, K to 12, not just six to 12. Um, so I think the ability to make them each um, uh, a point two like the other um, instructional leaders and chairs um, would be really important. So, you know, anytime we talk about what students are gonna know and be able to do, um, part of it is also, how do we know? So, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt, who's gonna talk more about that. Thanks. So, uh, just to sort of jump into uh, one of the comments that Dave made a few minutes ago about lesson design, what we coming, teachers coming to really uh, grasp this year is uh, the importance of articulating clearly the goals for the lessons, not only for their own understanding of the efficacy of their lessons so they can judge how students are preparing and how um, and how well they're able to perform the skills that they've been developing but also for students uh, the clear articulation of the goals of each uh, lesson is is critical um, you know one of the things that Dave has said before is that we at high school have seen lessons that seem to roll over days uh, three and four days in a row they don't seem to have sorry um, they don't always have a, a beginning or middle or an end but what we're coming to see uh, recently is a more episodic nature uh, to the teaching strategy where each lesson has uh, a distinct uh, goal and a closing activity that uh, measures the efficacy of the lesson the students ability to perform that that task um, and teachers use that information and we'll talk more about that in a minute um, but these closing activities also very often give students insight into their own areas of need as they uh, as they work through the the work um, so an example of that would be for example um, some of the BARD protocols that we've seen ask the students to uh, explore their thinking through writing and um, you know some of the closing activities that we've seen there ask the students to reflect not only on uh, <coughs> the writing they did in the day but the process the way that their thinking evolved over time and how they got there one of the poignant closing activities I saw recently asked a student to 
explain how the protocol complicated their thinking, uh, which I thought was a really interesting prompt. It asked the kids to not only uh, explain where they are, what, what conclusions they, they arrived at, but also how they got there, what changes their thinking went through, and what provoked those changes. It was very self-reflective, and students are able to uh, assign those changes to the different skills that they've been working on in the classroom, whether it's analysis of a figurative language or, or, um, or, or tracking sourcing. Um, and the other thing that we're think, seeing a lot of this year is what we're calling exam wrappers or post-assessment activities, because while those closing activities give us a lot of insight into the small moments, students get uh, a lot of information back uh, on as assignments like uh, exams, essays, and projects. And very often, I think we find kids uh, see their scores and stop looking. Uh, they see the 87 or they see the 83, and that's the end of the conversation for them. What we're trying to coach our students to do is be more reflective about where that number came from and how they can use their feedback to improve their practice in the future. Uh, very excited to see that in a lot of our classrooms, in particular in the living environment uh, team. Each of those teachers has instituted a post-assessment post reflection where students really dig deeply into the test, which questions have I missed, and then once I've identified where I missed, um, where I wasn't able to show my strength, ask the students to sort of consider why. Uh, was this a uh, conceptual misunderstanding? Was this a lack of preparation? Um, and then at the end, they have a document that is something that, one, they can use to affect their planning in the future. It certainly <laughs> informs extra help sessions and it informs the way they study. But more importantly, for those students who are really struggling, uh, who may be involved in an AIS class, it informs the AIS teacher about what the area of need is so that when that student comes to see them, it isn't a broad support. It is a focused support. Um, my area of weakness is, my, is on the concept of mitosis and not living environment. My area of weakness is um, factoring quadru uh, poly polynomials. It's not algebra. It's specific. And so when I'm in that room, my time with the teacher is focused and the outcomes um, feel more supportive of my own needs. And then I would tie that in also to the work that uh, Allison was speaking about before with RTI. We're very excited to be working with the middle school uh, to develop that protocol. You know, what, some of the work there is helping our teachers to really fine tune a clear understanding of where the students are struggling. Uh, very often, uh, teachers, I think, uh, see poor outcomes on tests or uh, incomplete homework assignments and um, need some help to sort of fine tune exactly where the need is. The RTI protocols that we're putting in place are helping kid, teachers to uh, understand really where it comes from. And then once there, to align strategies that support those skills. Um, both in, gen in the general classroom and also in the AIS class. Uh, so we're excited about the work that we're doing there. I think we're seeing a lot of improvement in terms of uh, teacher engagement in the RTI process. And I'm hopeful that uh, as we continue to see this through, the support classes that we offer through the RTI, whether it's AIS or uh, things related to that, uh, are more focused on student need. Um, and hopefully as a result, we'll see increased student performance. spoken a lot about, you know, the vision around master schedule and, you know, obviously very excited and passionate about the work. Um, people know I can start to speak for hours about it, but I'll make sure I know it. Um, you know, I know I sent out a, a, a recent um, email and information to everyone around timeline. You know, as we've been digging deeper and deeper into the master schedule work, we realize that it's a really important decision that we're going to make and one that, um, not only will create spaces in our days for students to have important pause, but um, to you know sort of redefine culture around learning um, as it exists at the high school. So some of that is around uh, um, the redesign of, of classroom time, and some of that is around you know redesigning um, how we look at the day and create spaces.
spaces for students to be able to either explore um, enrichment or um, um, extend learning um, and or get help in classes that they're already taking. So, you know, I know, I know we've had a chance to go through some of the details, so I, I don't want to get into that. But I think one of the things that we've been realizing as we're still trying to figure out exactly what's the right <coughs> model for the high school is how important it's going to be to make sure that our, our implementation plan is really thoughtful. So, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of really important steps, ways to engage students in that process, um, ways to further engage the faculty. So I think it's something just like all the intervention enrichment period an opportunity to create a rotation of clubs, a rotation of um, extra help sessions, um, an opportunity to have so many things that we want at the high school that aren't currently regularly embedded in our process um, to make sure that we have students and faculty members coming together to, divine, to design what that time is gonna look like is gonna be really important and really exciting. Um, you know, another thing that we have to think about when we're talking about the master schedule is our spaces and redefining spaces. So if we're gonna create time in the day where students are going to have some choice around whether or not they wanna meet with a teacher or whether or not they're gonna experience a club setting, um, there's gonna be a certain flexibility in movement around campus for the entire student body at once um, that is important for us to look at. What does the quad look like? Um, we've talked about lunch, whether it's um, a unit lunch where the entire high school has lunch at the same time or whether it's um, two versions of that where half the school has lunch in each of those given slots. Um, in either way, we're looking very differently as campus, as cafeteria almost, um, to use that expression. So, you know, creating flexible spaces, creating opportunities, looking at, you know, uh, rather than just expecting students to sit on the floor and have lunch, where might we be looking ahead to certain <coughs> future options, whether they're backless benches where students can sort of use them in flexible ways, um, it's gonna be really important for us to design that. So while we're not looking at next year's budget um, per se to purchase that furniture, it is certainly something to be looking ahead to and something that is gonna be an important um, concept to, to support these goals. Jumping back to before the master schedule, I, I just, uh, you, you often share that uh, focused on teaching thinking, and I, th I think what you just shared was a really great, some great examples of that. Uh, you know, reflecting back on my my student experience and maybe anybody else. I mean, I just I don't think that we thought that way as a student or had those types of conversations. And it's really interesting to to hear about that work and the focus. You know, with the closing tickets that that is giving you know a focus and purpose to each individual class period. Um, so that's that's very interesting. Um, Related to the, the master schedule, uh, I really thought you did such an excellent job, the two of you, with your parent information session in, in the fall. Uh, I, you know, before having that opportunity to, to have that deep dive, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was hard to really connect, with, perhaps, with it. But uh, you, you absolutely sold me on you know understanding just how little club time our high school students have now, or 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 the challenge of of seeing. Uh, Teachers for extra help if you know if you have a ninth period class, etc. The the ability for it to reduce stress levels because these these new schedules uh, will will offer a, a similar instruction amount of instruction time, but just by their structure will reduce probably the homework load that students have. Um, but I, to be to be very frank, I I think that uh, you talked about two kinds of schedules: a, a, a drop schedule. Uh, which is a similar length in schedule, but a class dropping off every day and, and the class is rotating through the day so that math might be zero period at one point and a, a later period later in the week. Uh, and the block being, uh, I guess, a 77 minute uh, period. So, um, you know, I walked away with it thinking that the drop was a no brainer, but clearly the committee, which includes the department heads and, and administrators, uh, is still. Uh, you know, wrestling with that, and I'm just wondering if you could speak some more to what are seen as the advantages of a block schedule, um, just because it, for me it, it seemed like it's a significant shift. Maybe that's the benefit, the significant shift needed for uh, the practice of teaching a, a class that's nearly double the length. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think when we've received feedback both from students and from teachers about block schedule, I think there is a 
there's a theoretical vision that is really enticing um, for many in both of those cohorts. So a lot of the feedback we heard from students was that the idea of being able to have more of a college-like schedule where they can balance out, only have half of their classes in a given day and have that rotate through and, and sort of balance their load, as well as the opportunity to have classes that get deeper into more hands-on learning um, where the, the, the experiences in the classroom can be different and more flexible um, was something that they were really excited about. And likewise, um, teachers recognize that. Some of the same challenges around that are, um, you know, it's a big commitment to change. So, um, you know, for uh, a teacher to go from 42 minutes to 77 minutes um, is a really different approach in how you look at your day-to-day -day lesson planning um, and the commitment to be able to do that. So some of that is time to be able to prepare for that and some of that, quite frankly, is professional development um, and, and, and help in supporting one another get there. So I think students, while they talk philosophically about knowing that, they also anticipated that if some of their experiences in 42 minutes were merely just expanded to 77 minutes of that same experience, they could see where it would be um, challenging and uh, wouldn't be uh, the, the approach that they would want to go with when um, selecting uh, the next master schedule. So I think some of what the scheduling committee has been trying to anticipate and figure out is, you know, A, we want to create a master schedule that we can grow into. It's not just a master schedule that we, well, while we want to implement the very best product that we can, we also recognize that we want room for growth. So, um, you know, there, there are two different things that we look at and trying to support there. So one is, um, what feels right right now? What feels right five years from now? And are there things that we need to do to support the long term vision? I hope I'm answering your question. Well, then I think just to maybe bring it around a little bit that, uh, so there's still work ongoing with the scheduling committee, but in the maybe not too distant future, <coughs> because you communicated that there's going to be some opportunity for public engagement. Absolutely. There'll be another presentation about where we are in next step. So, at the high school? Yeah. Yeah. so speaking of the, the long-term vision and, and how this may be an iterative process, um, clearly the strategic plan was a long-term vision. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you see this master schedule aligning with some of the objectives that were in the strategic plan? Well, I, I mean, listen, we talk about the strategic plan being about um, enriching our, our students' learning experiences. So, you know, I'm, I'm think thinking specifically <coughs> about, you know, some of the, the seven goals, the you know, global learners and. Sure, um, I, you know, I'll look down, down the list here. So in the first bullet, the, the, it talks about providing students with a rigorous, comprehensive, and rich and diversified curriculum. So, I mean, I think we talk about that often in, in, in the high school. Um, when I think of the master schedule and the ability to encourage innovation, um, I think the ability to go from 42 minutes to 77 minutes or 52 minutes provides definitely in each class the opportunity for students to do deeper. You know, we talked tonight about, um, Matt and I spoke about where by asking what students are going to be able to do, I think it's a shift towards um, that idea in the classroom of putting the learning more into the student plan. Um, and then when I think of that enrichment and uh, intervention period, Catherine, I think of opportunities for our students to start exploring learning that doesn't even exist here yet. You know, I, I'm anticipating a growth of clubs and experiences that students want to dictate. Um, so I think our master schedule, you know, would be very much in line to doing those things. And, you know, another thing that we talked about uh, as a goal and strategic plan was around the culture and the culture of learning. Um, I think we're already starting to see that culture shift. Um, you know, one of the things that I've talked a lot in recent weekly blasts is the collaborative aspect that I'm seeing in classrooms, uh, the amount of students that are uh, high-fiving one another when they're giving uh, certain responses and answers. And I think the more that we create these spaces, whether it's a unit lunch or, or the two lunch periods or an IE period, 
where students are going to have more time in their day to be able to explore their own learning or to go to either a teacher or even to one another. I think of our National Honor Society peer tutoring program. Um, I think that speaks to the collaborative nature of schools that we want to build upon. Okay, I have a question. I missed it. I apologize. Maybe just shut me up. Um, I heard uh, David and Allison talk a lot about common assessment. And Matt, when you were talking about assessment, I just wanted to know what, like, talk about how what common assessment might look like, and um, just to the board members, is the idea of common assessment. That, you know, teachers in the ELA department or the English department in high school giving common assessments within the classes that exist in the same strand, right? Or is there an opportunity for common assessment if there aren't two classes in the same strand? Uh, you know, I, I think that it, it's, it's twofold. The, the simple answer is yes. I think where some of the challenge lies in the high school is that at the same grade level we may see, like I think of our English program. So we offer a variety of different selectives. So an assessment in a graphic <coughs> novels class versus a creative writing class are not necessarily appropriate to be aligned. Um, you know, if we have multiple sections of uh, an algebra class or multiple sections of a social studies class and the ability to make, you know, to look for common assessments I think could be really important. Um, you know, Matt talked about, you know, uh, our growth with RTI and the ability to, you know, eventually do benchmarking. Mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be a really important conversation at the high school as well. Um, question, well, first, a comment about the use of Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. Never realized that there are so many benefits to Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. The biggest one that I love is the lack of printing in the house of the home <laughs> assignment that they need to hand in because everything is done electronically, which I'm happy about that. Mm -hmm. um, but you refer, you spoke about the use of Chromebooks in the classrooms, how excited the teachers are, and how they're basically fighting over it, which means. You know, you kind of indicated perhaps, you know, another ask of more Chromebooks. Can you <coughs> give an example of how they're using them mm -hmm. in the classroom that teachers, you know, want to use more of them? Sure. Um, you know, I've seen in, so I've seen in math classes recently, um, in working with our metamorphosis coach, they're learning how to use certain websites um, free resources, but where students can use the Chromebooks to be able to um, play with different examples of angles or with certain concepts that are going on uh, in, in the class. So it's allowing for a more discovery approach. Um, I think we've seen in a lot of social studies and English classes, uh, typical writing assignments. Uh, um, Matt, I don't know if you want to speak into some more of those. Yeah, we've seen a couple of different examples, in the, especially in the English department, of uh, teachers using the Chromebooks to allow students to do group projects that really are um, all-inclusive, a variety of different media points. So I know that, for example, in English 9, they, do, they did a project recently where students were asked to build um, a multimedia presentation that wasn't just a PowerPoint. It was a PowerPoint presentation, but there's also there's a writing assignment, and there was a variety of research points involved with it, and students were able to do independent work that was sort of feeding into the same place and all the time building off of each other's work. So there's a lot of real-time collaboration <clears throat> that allows students to do where in the past that was something that, was, that had to be done outside of school hours, uh, hard to get kids together in the same place at the same time. It's a great, great big challenge in that. Um, and here we have really the ability to access their, their collaborative learning and sort of crowdsource their responses in a way that really works for kids. Um, so I know they're doing that in English class quite a bit, and I've seen it in social studies as well. And I'm thinking also about the work that they're starting to build around the uh, collaboration with English and science uh, for, the, for the writing class, and about how they can use that same sort of practice to do some scientific research as well, and then bleed that into their writing piece. Um, the sky's the limit. It's really impressive stuff. You guys have um, you've talked a little bit about when you're talking about back to schedule, um, you talked about innovation in clubs, um, supporting the student needs. How our conversation is transitioning being a lot more student centered right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, in looking forward to next year, I know there's some interest for clubs, but we also have some other increased interest from students and some other opportunities that, that we're looking at for potentially for the budget process. Yeah, so I mean, you know, you talk about clubs and certainly students have come forward, but um, you know, I also sometimes have to look at unique needs from year to year. So, um, you know, I know we came forward a couple of years ago and talking about the vocational program and some needs there. 
Um, we're currently dealing with um, uh, some pretty unique needs in our sophomore class. Um, and when we start looking ahead to supporting that grade, uh, entry into the VOTEC program as um, 11th graders becomes really important. So we had uh, settled into looking at um, three students a year from the general education side. Um, but given the unique need, we've really identified eight student, a need for eight students. Um, and it's a fairly large ask. Um, it can run approximately $16,000 to $17,000 a student um, per year for the program. Um, but we also look at it as, as, as um, a really important need to round out. Um, an educational experience for students. So it allows students to target not only um, post-secondary um, skills that they can use right out of high school, um, but it's also an opportunity for them to um, gain some of their academic credits in more hands-on settings. Um, so it's proven to be a really strong partnership. Uh, we've seen with uh, the change of pathways to graduation from the state um, and um, a CDOS certificate being one of those extra ways that students can get there. Um, the need for us to look at our um, vocational program um, through VOCES as a uh, greater opportunity and specifically in this case for our unique 10th grade um, raises you an important need. Is this Bridges to Community? Is that what you're referring to? So, so our Bridges program is different. Our Bridges okay. program that we have is strictly for uh, seniors and it's uh, something that we do in-house. I'm talking about students who spend half of each day um, at the um, off-site BOCES program. So they may be uh, doing TV and production, they may be doing automotive, they uh, may be doing carpentry, they can be looking at um, different technical skills to um, help round out their, their experience. Culinary. Culinary, exactly. So um, as we're thinking about unique situations such as that, we, you know, I can't, I don't want to, before we get, we, we come back to Dow's Lane, I don't want to overlook some things from, from the middle school and thinking about, you know, one thing that's come up from year to year is that we're losing kids after school because of transportation issues. And, um, and then, you know, we're also looking at some other opportunities at the middle school that I think Kind of we can build from here if we're thinking about what's happening at the high school. Um, so I don't know if Dave and Allison want to some of your thoughts about next year there. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, we, we've talked in the past about um, some issues of access with respect to um, transportation, uh, quite frankly. Right now and, and, and for some time, we've not offered any form of transportation <coughs> after the school day for our students. Um, so if, if a student is uh, a student that needs to take a bus in order to get home from school, their, their option is to leave at 3.20 uh, at our dismissal time, and, and that's, um, you know, that, that's the only option that, that we provide. Anything beyond that either requires them to walk, uh, oftentimes a, a substantial distance, or to arrange for their own transportation. And what that does is it limits the ability for students to participate in things like our homework center um, or certain clubs that meet after school. Um, you know, I'm thinking about, for instance, our, our spring musical that, that kind of kicked off its first rehearsal today. Um, it's a real challenge for students that, that you know, uh, need that transportation to, to be a part of some of these things. So, um, and, and I would say that it also is a limitation with respect to us <laughs> identifying new opportunities. Uh, one of the things that, that, that would restrain us from perhaps offering an opportunity after school is a recognition that Certain students, especially you know, perhaps those that we might be targeting toward, are, are unable to participate. So, uh, we're proposing um, the restoration of, of late bus uh, service from the campus. Um, you know, I think there's some 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 good discussion and dialogue that could be had around you know the timing of that and and, and so forth and, and and the exact structure. But but it is something that has been missing for some time and and does have an impact on on a certain uh, number of members of our district that uh, I, I, w I think we would do well to, to rethink. Um, Dave also talked a little bit about the, uh, the addition of art staff uh, that he proposed um, at the high school. Um, and, you know, and I think it actually ties in well with, with some of the things that I was talking about before when we think about the opportunities that we're looking to present to students to round out their educational experience at the middle school. Art is one of the unified arts programs that our students take in all three grades, six, seven, and eight, um, as required by the state, but also a program that we value highly at the middle school. 
Um, it's our one unified arts program that has not um, been mm -hmm. able to be rebuilt since the, the uh, budget-related staffing cuts that we've made in the past. Um, and as a result, there are limitations uh, in the day on when students can get art that would prevent them from taking it um, and, and also being able to access some of these programs that, that I talked about earlier. Um, you know, a small restoration of, of art staffing um, could actually add a great deal of <coughs> flexibility to our program, ensure that all kids can get that uh, to the extent that they have room in their schedule to get it. Um, and also, you know, bring those class sizes in line, of what, in line with what we would value for the, the full art experience that we want to have. You know, our classes have, have, have gotten you know, notably larger in those, in those art classes than, than we would want them to be under, under desirable circumstances. <coughs> so um, re restoring the, the sections that we lost there uh, is part of our proposal for this year. Um, you know, and finally, I think just with an eye on, on what our realities are uh, with, at, at Main Street School in terms of enrollment, in terms of student needs, um, we know that we've seen a growth in the population of, of our special education students. Um, and so we do have an eye right now on that situation and are, and are looking at what needs might exist with respect to, um, to staffing to make sure that we are at appropriate levels to, to meet the needs of the students as they enter the middle school so that we can support them in the way that, that we are committed to and, and, and are accustomed to being able to do um, for, for all students in our building. It's one of the things that we're, we're really proud of is the level of support that we provide. Um, it's, it's one of the things that we get feedback on that is, that is quite positive. Um, and so as we look at, at a population that may have uh, certain numbers that are higher than what we've you know, been somewhat accustomed to, uh, we have our eye on that situation. And you know, I'm not sure exactly where that will sit right now for next year, but we are, we are you know, watching it closely. Thank you for bringing that up. So, you know, if, you remember, if the board or community remembers back the budget discussions last year, we built out a lot of flexible, creative ways of, ad of addressing our students' needs to best serve them in the district and flexible use of staff. So as we're going through these final budget planning stages, one of the things that we're doing is looking at how do we be creative? How do we look at the use of our staff to recognize that we do have a larger cohort of kids that are to best be able to support their needs. Um, so we're looking at those moving pieces across the district um, to see what we can do to best to, um, deliver those, those services to meet kids' needs, one, but to, to do so in the most re responsible manner. Um, so that's something that they've certainly looked at more conversation on. Um, but as we shift, and I don't want to forget our friends at Dallas Lane, <laughs> that um, I think that transition, you know, when we think about um, where we are and talking about kids, I think great entry point, not only for some of you working around character this year, but also some of the needs for next year related to kids. So, I'm Deb glad and Andy. You the best for last. <laughs> we did. Uh, <laughs> okay. So certainly thank you for this opportunity to share the great work of Dow's Lane. Um, Andrea and I have chosen some examples to share with you to highlight really in, within the two goal areas this work um, that we have to start by giving great compliments to the teachers of Dow's Lane and the staff um, from every interventionist to our clinicians to every classroom teacher. Um, in order to really deepen student thinking, we need to examine our own. That's the premise of teaching thinking. So that takes a great level of commitment um, from all staff and Andrea and I have the pleasure of leading and witnessing their work, but certainly they're the ones that are truly engaged in it um, and committed to it. So we hope that you'll hear three common themes as we share the types of examples of work we're doing at Dow's Lane. Um, one evolving or revolving around this collaborative model and this shared decision making and this consistent feedback loop that we're in with the staff of Dow's Lane. The second is the use of intervisitations and breaking down classroom walls, getting into each other's classrooms, looking at each other um, in practice to look at evidence of student thinking. And the last layer is the use of student work. And the p purposeful pushing back in we're doing this year around having teachers examine not only their own students' work, but the work of their colleagues as we look at the different areas um, of Dow's Lane in terms of instructional practice, but especially student thinking. Um, so yes, we would like to start by sharing um, the work around character building. Um, this has been the development of a character building program at Dow's Lane. 
um, and to examine the type of thinking we want students to be doing. And we do that, we did that this year by adding a layer that speaks directly to the strategic plan, which is to really engage students as active participants in their school and in their culture. So each month we have engaged staff and students in the development of a student-led assembly program. And Michael, you were able to witness one on Crazy Half Day, um, extra special for you. Got a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this has been an opportunity for teachers to engage students in a culmination of the work of the month where we really deeply examine essential questions related to habits of mind and character building to allow students to make decisions around how do they want to teach others. So the greatest way to show what we learn and what we're able to do is if can we teach others what we know. So we've given students the opportunities, opportunity to be active participants in the teaching of what their thinking has been based on this work each and every day through morning meeting, through explicit instruction, as well as through those natural teachable moments that happen all throughout it's the glory of K3. Um, and we've also done that by being in each other's classrooms. So we took our teachers, full staff, um, on a walk, a learning walk, into each other's classrooms um, for a faculty meeting with the essential question for our is how do we know? So this relates to assessment. But what is the evidence of student thinking? What is the evidence of the presence of a deep and comprehensive character building program at Dow's Lane? And that work was powerful. It took a risk taking for every teacher to allow colleagues into their classrooms to look for the evidence of the essential questions, to look for the evidence of student work, for the feel and the presence of character building and habits of mind and dispositional work in each and every one of our classrooms, as well as our shared spaces of, at Dow's Lane. And this helped to inform the committee. We have a character committee that takes this feedback, takes this work that teachers are doing collaboratively to make future decisions for our program. Um, our work around character building is greatly entrenched in what we believe about social emotional learning and how achievement is directly related to social emotional learning. So not only because of some new state regulations, but because it's what we believe in. Um, one of our um, budget um, visions or ideas that we have for Dow's Lane is the, the, the addition of a guidance counselor. Um, this guidance counselor could increase the level of explicit instruction but do it in a way where we're providing those opportunities for meaning making and transfer for students. We can teach them the knowledge of what character building and habits of mind is all about. We can provide opportunities to try on skills, but we really need to give them those opportunities to try them on at recess, to try them on in the hallways, to have that social skills um, extra layer for students that need it to be able to work with their peers and do the things that we heard them do at the GOB where they are working together and supporting each other and complimenting but also having empathy for each other. So it all begins at Dow's Lane. That's where the journey begins. Um, this also yeah, just on yeah. that K-5. K-5. Just for the, yes, for the counselor. Yes, just excuse me. Yes. It's a shared K-5. Uh, thank you. I apologize. Yeah. Um, that also relates to this wonderful vision that we have for Dow's Lane around a peaceful, pro a peaceful playground. Um, this is our new site-based project. Um, peaceful Playground is a wonderful program where it's an implementation um, right there on our front playground where we create, it's an unstructured, structured experience for <laughs> students to really try on and practice all of the skills and habits of mind that we're teaching throughout each month. Peaceful Playground is a direct installation right into the flooring of the playground. Um, and it actually creates these structured ways in which for students to engage with each other. Um, it promotes mindfulness. It's an anti-bullying um, program where it's actually connected to some explicit instruction with students as well as professional development for our staff. Um, so as we look <coughs> ahead and we look at how we can expand our opportunities for learning and growing, recess is the perfect classroom in which to teach these habits of mind and these character building skills. So we take it from a global kind of building level um, example and I turn it over to Andrea for a more explicit example at the grade level. Sure, hi everyone. So all of our teachers have been working with Nancy Deacon, the literacy coach, K-5, but specifically our kindergarten teachers have been working with Nancy to create a YAG, a Y-A-G, a year at a glance, 
So we were taking the teaching points of the skills that the students would need in a progression of literacy from September to June. And the teachers collaborated together, used student work to see what the students' needs were, how to best meet them. And then we are taking those specific examples and we're going to work to embed them into the unit planners. So bring them right back to everything that they've already created, the students' <coughs> thinking, the teaching of thinking, and everything that the children would know to be successful in literacy for the whole year through kindergarten. So it's been an incredible project and a very metacognitive project because they're looking at the student work, they're looking at their teaching, and who they are as teachers to help the children through the year. So we're hoping to continue that with all of the grade levels also. Mm -hmm. um, and keeping in line with uh, what we feel is a, a powerful instructional practice at Dows Lane certainly is our approach to literacy with the balanced literacy approach. Um, one component of balanced literacy is the workshop model, which we can use for reading and writing, but workshop model can also be implemented in every classroom across Dows Lane, from art to PE um, to every grade level. Um, so we're, the teachers have worked on this through the development of a goal together last year. This all stems from work that we did at the end of last year to really name our goal for what our instructional practices look and sound like for literacy at Dows Lane. So what we decided this year, we've done an amazing launch in 2018 in January <coughs> um, with some very structured and comprehensive PD around balanced literacy with our first focus on the workshop model. Um, we're really excited about this work because what it embeds again is the intervisitation and the looking at student work to examine the thinking that we want students to be doing, the meaning making they do when they're reading. And workshop model is a phenomenal approach to allowing students to make meaning on their own and to make their thinking visible so that students can really formulate their instructional decisions for what a student in particular needs when it comes to reading and writing. Um, one of the most exciting things that we're launching is what we would call a lab site experience with Nancy Deacon. Um, and what we have designed and will be implementing in February are lab site locations within our building where Nancy would be modeling um, elements of workshop model based on a very differentiated approach to workshop model. We recognize there are many teachers that utilize workshop model, so we're taking a polish, validate, and learn approach. What do you want to polish about your practice? What's validating about your practice? And can we witness it in the practice of others? And what do we want to improve on? Where do we want to grow in the workshop model and in our implementation? So I would share that we sent out the form um, to launch this just yesterday. And within, I think, eight hours, we had 19 out of 26 of our classroom teachers responding mm -hmm. um, that they want to participate. So again, getting into each other's classrooms, looking at student work. So this is very exciting. Um, each one of these opportunities deepens student thinking because we're doing such hard work to examine our own. Um, so the next goal is around assessment. Um, so with our approach to some very comprehensive and consistent PD, we have framed every session with teachers with the question, so how do we know? Um, and it's dipping teachers back into this examination of a definition of balanced assessment, which we shared with all of you. Self-examination, which is so an important piece of it. If we want students to self-reflect, we also have to self-reflect. And that's a process that we learn, and it takes, it takes a, an element of risk um, for, to self-reflect. But certainly we have some tremendous examples of the creation and the development of a balanced assessment system at Dows Lane. One you've heard so much about from our other schools, and I know if Joyce were here, she would also speak to the power of the RTI model as a building-wide balanced system of assessment. Um, the work has grown at Dow's Lane since we shared our last, at our last goal review, um, and even at our last board meeting where we looked at some explicit examples of Ames Web data. Um, we just engaged with staff in a tremendous two days um, called uh, data meetings. Each teacher met with the entire intervention team, our entire data team, to explicitly look across their class at each of the data points that we developed this year. So Ames Web is one of our data points. Um, we looked at each grade level at three different times of the year and created some t a three, four, five, six point criteria system 
to really look deeply at students um, and what they know and where they need to grow and where do we have students that are really performing and what do we do for them. Um, so this has been exciting work and it has engaged every staff member of our building. So one of the goals that we had at our last meeting was to really support teachers in learning these data uh, profiles and the, these skills plans that AmesWeb has a tremendous amount of information. You can't possibly get it all at once. This was such a, a, a powerful day, two powerful days. We walked out feeling um, really successful because not only did it engage in conversations about the here and now, students, and what are we going to do for them in their classrooms, but it also engaged us in some really good goal work around where do we go next and how do we know we're being successful and how do we build this and where are the areas that we can build our capacity around the use of data um, and the development of student thinking. So it all relates back to that. Um, so that's a very broad building wide. Every single teacher specialist um, interventionist is involved in the Ames Web and RTI process. So now we'll, we'll, we'll get a little more microscope for, you know, when we'll dig in to some specific examples of the work that teachers are doing for their classrooms. Related to RTI, yeah. Related to RTI the classroom teachers have all had professional development on tier one interventions. That would be the teacher teaching best practices in the classroom and also focused interventions based on what the child needs, whether it's literature, re reading, writing, math. Um, our special area teachers have also been trained, so we're working on behavioral interventions, um, attention, focus, um, behavior management in all the areas in the building. And then we have interventionists working on um, a little more intensive interventions, tier two and tier three interventions. So it's working. It's explicit instruction. It's direct. It's specific to the children's needs, whether it's a, a child with a learning gap, a new student to the district, or someone that just learns at a different pace. And then because the teachers are differentiating in the classroom, they're able to meet the needs of all the children. So every different level of child is being met through that system. Mm -hmm. And our examination of stage two, which is assessment, um, as we deepen our, think our thinking about the what we want students to be thinking, a natural connection has happened to the stage one work, which is all about assessment. Um, we've had experiences where we, we're engaging with teachers thinking about what it is that we're really asking students to be doing. For example, we had a powerful grade level session with third grade on informational writing. We went back into our unit planner and we really dug deep about laying the standards out, laying out the skills, really talking about what is it that we want students to know and be able to do as a result of this unit. And we opened up our stage two, what had been put in there, and it was an aha moment. The teachers looked at it and said, this, we need to change this. We need to really develop an assessment that truly gets to what it is that we're asking students to be doing. It was such a natural, organic moment. And it was a re as a result of this commitment to looking at student work, to looking at pre-assessments, and then using that. What that moment did, changed and shifted our plan for some explicit work with Shelley Harwain, taking a pre-writing -pro prompt that every third grade teacher did and laying them out side by side, colleague next to colleague, with Shelley there to marvel at student work, but to really mine in to where we need our writing instruction to go. So those are some examples of some building wide, some real shared decision making, breaking down those classroom walls, getting into each other's um, experience as teachers, but also into student experiences, and then looking ultimately at the student work as evidence always of where we need to grow, PLTW. So it, one of the most amazing opportunities that we brought to Dow's Lane was the third grade PLTW program. Um, the evidence of student thinking as it relates to science, technology, engineering, and math has been phenomenal. It has transferred into the genius hour projects that students are doing, into these um, moments that they're having around math and science in their classrooms. What we need is to expand that. Um, we have wonderful opportunities in the school where we have teachers that have worked with the IAF to bring some maker thinking, some STEM challenges, um, some coding into our library media. But what we're really looking for is an opportunity to bring STEM, that science, technology, engineering, and math to our K2 students. To build that foundation and that knowledge base, that thinking 
that we want students to be doing alongside this other learning because it truly does inform their thinking about the world. So when we think about the strategic plan and we're really looking for those opportunities to see themselves as participants in the world, you have to do that through a science, technology, engineering, and mathematical lens. So our vision for Dow's Lane is to bring that innovation um, to our K-2 students, our little ones, um, so that we can lay that foundation for them and really complete that circuit, that continuum of PLTW across the district. understand how it affects my kids in the class. Mm -hmm. And so I, I sit here kind of trying to keep up mm -hmm. with what you're talking about. And then I say, but I see this. I see that. I've seen it for several years now. And it always impresses me when I see awesome. examples of that, where, where kids get what they need. And what they need are different. And mm -hmm. the teacher can still keep the whole class going at the same time. So congratulations if that's, you know, if that's evidence of the work that sure. you were you were clearly so focused on. Um, the, other, the other question was related to the science mm -hmm. learning and mm -hmm. uh, does, does the Dallas Lane Drawings play a role yes, in, it does. in this <laughs> science that you're going to bring to the kids? Yes. Because, I mean, it's sort of in a place mm -hmm. where it's in between. So we're in transition, um, and certainly we are proud of keeping our garden program alive through our hands-on garden program with the PTSA and the work of our parent volunteers um, that are working side by side with teachers to keep that garden an active um, and wonderful experience for, for all children K-2. We're in, as David had shared about the Next, Gen Next Generation Science Standards, which New York State adopted. Um, and we are in a collaborative process with point people from across every grade level to examine the new standards and begin to build our curriculum with two lenses. One, PLTW, and where PLTW can really become in, in part of that delivery of science instruction, and then our garden. Um, and really with the promise to make, keep our garden not only alive and well, but to make it an, uh, an instructional practice that lives in our science um, and building that commitment again from teachers, they love that garden. So to find organic and authentic opportunities to connect our garden to science instruction is the way to go. But in the meantime, we've added the club this Yes, year. so we have added a club this year um, that will begin as soon as our garden is back in garden season. <laughs> um, and we will, it, it's, it's a twofold, it's very similar to the garden where we, these students are actively participating in the maintenance of the garden, but we're adding some mindfulness to it and how um, the garden can promote that mindfulness. And the second area is the addition of the garden coordinator. And this was really an important component of moving forward with the transition of our garden program. And that was um, a point person in our building that really will help to manage the garden. There's a tremendous amount of planning and ordering and management um, that takes place to keep a garden going, especially a vegetable garden of our size. Um, I le have learned more about the rotation of plantings um, than I ever had before. And you should know that Dr. Cantor shared with me that she is an avid gardener. Um, so I, as David... So Dave, is she the coordinator? <laughs> yes. <No. laughs> so uh, Dave Cohen could attest that I have a love-hate relationship with plants. Um, I have a love <laughs> relationship with our Dow's Lane garden. <laughs> Right. So I think the expansion of clubs has been a goal, um, certainly since start you know coming back to Dow's Lane um, and those opportunities for students. So we've done expansion this year with our garden pro uh, club as well as the um, a Maker Thinking Club, which just launched um, with for first graders uh, Maker Thinking. Um, it's a, like a makerspace STEM for first grade, and we had 87 students 
um, want to participate. So that, that causes a process for us. We, we, we started our process very clearly. We can't possibly provide the experience for everyone, but what it said to us was this, this is something kids are into. Um, so that the those. OTW, I mean, really, oh. talk about a vote of a. Uh, oh, if you wow. want to gauge whether That's students crazy. want it, go by this very quick, you know, we sent out a permission slip, and in the first day, without even really promoting it, it's not even in my newsletter this week yet, and we had 87 students sign up. Um, but for next year, we're really looking at the expansion of our clubs um, to well rounded across grade levels, certainly looking at um, to complement the two after school classes that are now going to be offered through the YMCA enrichment program for world language. Um, but we have some interest from staff um, to develop some lunchtime clubs for kids, um, whether it's in a specific language or whether f in particular for kindergarten, to do a broad kind of walk across the languages where we could introduce our, our kindergartners to world language in a, in a different type of experience is very exciting. Um, and we're also looking at um, a math fun or a, uh, I forget what we call it, we have a catchy title, to bring some math um, options to our club um, offerings. Um, it's very difficult to look at a lunch club because you do have limitations in how many students this can, you can take in to fold. Um, but certainly being able to provide those enriching, challenging, kind of grapple experiences with math for students as an option. Um, and then we're also looking at the idea of, um, we've dabbled with student council, we want to look at third graders. Um, my last club is leaving me for, for this moment. I had it in my head just a few minutes ago, but those are just some examples of the ways in which we want to enhance a child's day and the options that they have and experiences that they can get involved in. It's very exciting. What's that looking like down, down, with, down with babies? Well, so we engaged, again, our, so, our social studies point people when this all came through and we were really looking at the inquiry and the shift of the framework, really engaging teachers in what, it, what thinking do we want students to do. So we actually went to look, we looked through the inquiry units that the state had provided and really examine those and how they align um, with our current curriculum as well as the development of new curriculum. And I think what we found was at K2, these inquiry units aligned in many ways because these are short units. Um, you're, you're engaging students in the thinking about community and themselves and the kindergarten curriculum in itself is all about me. Um, and what does it mean to be part of a community? It's directly aligned <coughs> to our character building program. But what we found was as the children progressed through fifth grade, the level of content that was required, we were not going to be able to meet that purely through the inquiry units. Um, so we're back in development, um, really looking at other Still programs. Still trying to figure out the best way, other programs, other yeah. approaches. You know, BOCES um, has, um, it's called the Social Studies ELA website that we use as a resource. Um, you know, we, we keep pushing through. Um, there weren't huge changes to the curriculum in the new standards. Mm -hmm. It's really more your approach. It's really ensuring that you're embedding inquiry. Um, I would say it's certainly a conversation K-5, but um, it's a conversation 612. And I would say that, um, more importantly, 612 um, at this point, mm -hmm. there's definitely um, a shift in the, in the assessments on the horizon at 612. So I think you've all probably heard us say it before, you know, the challenge of, of elementary K-5 is we're trying to have, you know, our teachers are teaching everything. Yeah. And um, we're always doing the, we're always trying to find the balance of, you know, knowing that the priority has to be reading, writing, and math. How do we use the content areas to promote the kind of thinking, though, that we want kids to mm -hmm. engage in? So I would say social studies, like science, continues to be more of a work in progress. Um, but continue, we're continuing on with unit development. I wanted to just add something. I'm not sure if people had questions for Deb, but if Joyce were sitting here right now. Um, Joyce would talk about a lot of the things, certainly, that Deb and Andrea talked about, interestingly, as well as some of what the middle school talked about, because that's what life in 4 or 5 is. Um, but one position that we have certainly floating out there in our conversation um, is this whole idea of additional technology and technology integration. So not PLTW, 
um, but actually supporting teachers in using technology in their classrooms. So um, we, I think many of you know, we sort of have a one-man show cooking around here in Irvington. It's called Jesse Lubinsky. Um, <laughs> And you know, Jesse's done a lot, and, he, and his, certainly his leadership has brought a lot of different experiences to our district and has moved a lot of our work. But we also know that in order to move technology and the integration, in other words, using in our instructional planners and lessons, that technology is at the root of that work. In order to do that, ultimately, we're going to need more support. So when we sat around the table and talked about, you know, weighing what are, what are the needs and probably what are the limitations, mm -hmm. um, we are commitment in the ask around technology is PLTW, K2. Um, for those of you that were, have been around, we proposed a K5, really, implementation, really K12. We said we were committed to having a STEM-based program in this district. And then the second year came and we didn't expand it. And the third year came and we didn't expand it. So here we are now. And we're, we're really um, committed, and that example of those first graders is quite <laughs> something. Um, but we really do believe that it's, it is time. We need a K-2 program, a K-2 program that will round out our commitment to K-5, um, a K-12. Um, but with that, I think we'd be remiss in, in, in not mentioning that the integration of technology and having that level of support, professional development, coaching, um, is definitely a piece that all of our teachers would benefit from and as a result all of our students. So I did just want to put that in there. So are those two FTE or is it one FTE? That's it's two job? different jobs. It did, so it is two FTE. And I mean quite honestly, while we would take it, um, the reality is of one FTE to support K-12 integration of technology. So that would be a starting point. Um, we've gone a long time with, with really very little technology support in district. Um, we have Jesse and, and two computer aides. Um, so. Are you able to get in every classroom, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. So, um, you know, I'm just Thank you. 
the library begins to look different? Does a library function differently for us? Does a computer lab? You know, Sounds kind of old school, say computer lab, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Conversation from earlier today. Um, but there's going to be lots of opportunities for us so to have right. these different types of conversations as we move forward. Um, from a buildings and grounds perspective, that's something we're starting to delve into and to look at what our future facility needs are. So want to have conversations about that as um, we move forward throughout this year to begin to plan for some of those needs to really make sure that not only are we delivering in the classroom, supporting our teachers and our kids for those four class experiences, but we're providing the physical spaces to promote that type of learning. Um, so, that's that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know where to go with this. I'm, I'm, I'm missing being able to talk to you, to Artie and to Jesse and to, and to Miguel. Uh, and so uh, I guess it's hard to put it all in. And, 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 uh, but uh, anybody have a, a burning question that they, they want to get? I know that we've spent uh, a, good, a good amount of time and there's never enough to uh, talk about everything that's happening. Very impressive. That's occurring in the schools. I mean, great job in terms of, of sharing that information about this work. And I believe that uh, it is an ongoing conversation in terms of uh, some of the budgetary asks that we're going to do a deep dive. I, I guess there was one question I wanted to ask in terms of our, for Carol, uh, you are asked to do so much, and I'm so impressed with what you are able to do. And one of the goals on here is this financial forecast, you know, this financial this. Uh, idea that uh, people have aspired to, to see in this district but not actually been able to develop. So is that something that uh, with all that's on your plate? Uh, it's, uh, it, it's definitely something that I work on periodically. I would love to have a little more time to really, you know, make it what I really want it to be. I'm, I'm getting at it dribs and drabs right now. And I'm working on our, our obviously a five-year plan. So it's definitely something that I'm going to have shortly, but it's I do it in piecemeal, and it is hard to, to get everything done, but, you know. I think know. there's an opportunity. I don't want to ever sound like I'm, I'm jumping in and coming to someone's defense. Um, but, you know, we, we regularly <laughs> talk about how, like, people are told in so many different ways yeah. that, um, you know, I look to any of my administrator colleagues and know that there could be five of you doing your job each day. Um, but when I look to Carol, um, Carol Carol with her so many different types of responsibilities and some that are becoming uh, very time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, Carol, as many people may not know, is our district registrar. <laughs> so every student that comes into our district somehow passes through our assistant superintendent's CPA. business office. Yeah. Um, so when we think about registration and as DAOs we know, right, we're gearing up for kindergarten registration in, in the near future. So there's lots of involvement from Carol's office. Um, and then we get, you know, in dribs and drabs throughout the, the spring and then the summer heats up again. But the one thing we never really um, anticipated is the, the volatility of kids in and out on a regular basis. And quite honestly, when we think about, I, I can go back to my first year and looking at, you know, the question, should we close Main Street School? And here we are five, six and a half years later and our enrollment is like at the same place. And all the demographic studies we looked at saw us dropping off hundreds of kids. And this week, how many, or in the last two weeks, how many enrollments? <laughs> I think we had 13 in, yeah. since January 1st. 13 since January, and an email that came yesterday with family moving in with six children. So, <laughs> so you're, you're children all gonna get one. one. <laughs> this year, this year, year still, so they're getting so there. That's last week, Carol. Quite last week. And, uh, <laughs> great. Shop, Carol, just let me know what shock and awe here because when we think about wanting to have a talented business official to dedicate her time to that just as we want our principals and teachers and directors to be doing this kind of work carol's registering kids and not that's not an important process carol should be doing other things um, and then another area that's become um, quite the burden is looking at um, carol serves as our public records slash oil officer <laughs> and um, in doing so, when we get requests that come in from the uh, public for documents, Carol is the one that is satisfying those requests, and it trickles out to people all over the district in identification of documents and, and, and having them reviewed by an attorney. Um, so
So when we look, there's there's hours and hours. And this week alone, I can say <coughs> probably dedicated, and it's Tuesday, you know, four or five hours to, to public records FOIL type work already. Um, so that said, so um, that's done instead of preparing for our, our 18, 19 budget mm -hmm. or doing financial well, forecasting. Well, uh, what it turns into is people working around the clock and and not getting to everything they want to do and not not doing everything they should be doing for themselves. So that said, um, I think one thing that is a consideration for us, and we know that our um, fine Elaine, Elaine Cardia um, is in the process of retiring, is we're trying to rediscover what that opportunity could look like to have a district clerk position, just like Doreen is here supporting us tonight, um, but to have that position, but also to round it out with the opportunity for someone to carry those other responsibilities. And of course, Carol and other staff would need to be involved, but it shouldn't sit on the assistant superintendent's desk to be registering the kids and, and doing basic level uh, public records information. Right. So. I hear that. Okay. All right. Well, I think uh, we, we've all uh, enjoyed this conversation, and uh, it will be ongoing with the budget process and, and other updates later in the year. So thank you so much. Just to foreshadow, the next uh, board meeting is on February 6th, and we will be presenting the operational side of, of the budget. Yeah. And then May 6th, yeah. uh, we will be talking um, the curriculum school. Excellent. March. 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 <laughs> May, May, we're already voting. May, we're already voting. I thought it was a long winter break. Voting. Yeah. It's really long. Yeah. It's a long winter, that's for sure. Right. Um, so where are we? We are at a place where we can uh, adjourn into uh, executive session. Our next meeting, as you said, is February 6th in our first uh, budget presentation. So thank you. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Can I point that teacher? Personnel matter? Oh, there's a part. Oh, oh, there is. Thank you. Yes, number four. I need that teacher. You know the job. <laughs> uh, so yes, we have a personnel matter appointment, appointment of a long-term substitute teacher. Uh, and it's not a consent agenda. So yeah, that would have been a problem, right? <laughs> so you get, you get bonus points for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so could I get a motion to approve uh, personnel matter 4.1? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Well, now, can I get a motion to uh, move to the discussion to so talk move. about the appointment of second? The All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good evening. Aye.